A couple of weeks ago, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the essay section, uh, by a Jesuit priest named Father James Martin called The Challenge of Easter. And in this article, he, uh, he said Easter, he made several interesting observations. The one that struck me was, he said, Easter, unlike Christmas in our culture, has somehow managed to avoid the extreme commercialization. When you th- isn't that true? I mean, if you think about it, when does the Christmas season start in our culture? Officially, when Starbucks releases its Christmas cups, right? <laughs> S- Christmas songs playing for months ahead of time, Hallmark Channel with the endless stream of the same movie with the same actors with different titles <laughs> for Christmas, right? But it's not the same with Easter. Starbucks doesn't have, have Easter cups. There aren't Easter songs playing in the stores. Hallmark, praise the Lord, does not release Easter movies for eternity. Some of you like those movies, I can tell. <laughs> we do have traditions at Easter, of course, but it's just not the same commercialized thing. One of the traditions, of course, is the egg hunt. How many of you have been on an egg hunt this year already? Are you kids? I have bad memories about an egg hunt. I, was, I, have, two, I have two sisters, and I have all grown cousins on both sides of the family. And we, one year, I think I was like eight or nine years old, my sister Jill, she can verify this, we had an egg hunt at my Uncle Bill's house at his church, and it was one of those things where the eggs weren't really hidden, they were just kind of laid out in the field, and they lined all the hundred the kids up, you know, and said, ready, go, which is a bad idea, parents. But I was just faster than all of them, and I got all the eggs, and I mean all of the eggs. <laughs> my pockets were full, my, the basket was full, my shirt was full, and my sisters were crying, and my cousins were crying, and my parents made me sit down and give out all the eggs evenly so we all had the same. I'm like, why have the hunt? I think that's when I became a capitalist. (laughs) In the article, Father Martin goes on to say that one of the reasons that Easter has resisted this commercialization is because the message is harder to tame and harder to sentimentalize than Christmas. And that's really true, isn't it? Baby Jesus in a manger, you know, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, that's kind of cute and nice. We can sentimentalize that. But the message of Easter begins with a grown man being tortured to death. No wonder we had to invent a bunny for the kids. It's different. It's got a harder edge to it. It's more subversive and, in a way, more powerful. I'll let you in on a little secret about pastors. Would you like to know? (laughs) Some of you are like, I don't know. (laughs) We put a lot of pressure on ourselves at Easter time. I'll tell you why. Because a lot of you are here for the first time or I haven't seen you since last Easter or Christmas. I'm glad you're here. By the way, welcome back. Hope to see you again, you know. But we put this pressure on ourselves because, like, we feel like, I gotta get, we got to nail it. It's got to be great so they'll come back. Or this is the one chance sort of thing. Think how crazy that is for a minute. we got to be interesting and clever and, and great and nail it. But the message is, a man claimed to be God, lived a sinless life, died a criminal's death, rose from the grave, appeared to his disciples, and ascended to heaven. And I'm in my office trying to figure out how to be more clever about this. This is the message, friends. This is the message. I just want to be faithful. And in fact, Jesus, he, when crowds would gather, sometimes he said things that when I read them, I go, I don't, I don't understand why he did it that way. In Luke 8, there's the story about the great crowds, people coming from all kinds of villages and towns to hear him. And here's what he said. There are all the hundreds and thousands of them. And he said, a farmer went out to sow a seed. Some seed fell on rocky places, didn't grow. Some on thorny places, got choked out. Some on uh, shallow places, and it didn't last. Some on good soil, and it produced a hundredfold crop. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Then he walked away. Like, that was the whole sermon. (laughs) And the disciples came to him later and like, what was that about? (laughs) And he's like, well, some have ears, and if they have ears, they'll hear. What? Here's what he's saying, quite literally. In a room like this, there's four kinds of people. I don't know who you are. The seed is the word of God. Now, last hour, there's nobody in the front row, so prepare yourselves, right? Because I'm just sowing seed, right? I'm just sowing seed. There you go. You can have that one for you, right? I'm just sowing seed. And some of you, some of you are here, and it's just going to do this. That's it. Because you're like, my wife said, if I come to this, I don't have to go to my mother-in-law's house later. I'm just, uh, you know, let's just get this, you know, it's just you. Some of you are going to go, oh, I want this. I want this. And you're going to take it in. But then after a while, you're going to go, you know, that, that doesn't taste very good anymore. I don't want that anymore. It's not going to last. Others of you are going to say, this is really important and interesting, and I, I want to think about this, but I'm busy right now. i got some stuff going on. I'm going to save this for later, and I'm going to come back to it, and you never will. Your life's just too cluttered. But some of you are ready. You're ready. You want to know God. You really want to know if God's real and if you can know him, and you're hungry, and you're ready to take it in. Now, again, I don't know you. Just sow and seed. 
But I pray that we are all in that fourth category. Let's bow together and ask God to speak to us. Father God, we come here from different places, carrying different burdens, but you know all things, you know our hearts. So I pray that you'd prepare the soil of our hearts that we might hear what you want to say. Pray it in your name. Amen. Now, if, if you receive not an email, but a, an actual letter from a law firm, and it looked legal stationary, looked official, and the letter said, you have received millions of dollars as an inheritance from a distant relative that you hardly know. If it was an email like me, you'd probably delete that, wouldn't you? There's a lot of scams out there. But if it was an actual letter, it looked, it looked official, and there was a number to call, how many of you would at least call the number? Really? You wouldn't do it? Some of you are like, I got plenty of money. Right? Or, or you're like, I know my relatives, they got nothing. Right? So, right? <laughs> You would, I would hope you would at least call, right? Why would you do that? Because, the, in other words, the offer's too great to just totally ignore it. You should at least check. I want you to think about the Easter message that way. What's being offered, if you understand it, is too great to ignore it. You could be skeptical, but you ought to at least investigate it. You ought to at least be open. Let's open to Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bible, you can turn there or follow on the screens. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Now, each of the four gospel accounts, and if you're not familiar with the Bible, there's one gospel, one message of good news. There's four guys, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, who write about it. We call those the gospels. It's a little confusing, I know. But they're writing four accounts of the same message. Each of them records, uh, obviously, the story of the resurrection with differing details. Not conflicting details, but a different emphasis. This is Luke's account of part of the resurrection. In every account, nobody's arguing the tomb is not empty. Think about that for a minute. The, the women come and they think the Romans have taken the body and they want to anoint the body, the corpse, so they think the Romans took the body away. Where'd you take him? The, the Romans think the disciples stole the body to perpetuate this hoax about a resurrection. The disciples are confused and don't know what's going on, but everybody is agreeing he's not in there. And I want you to pause for a minute and think about this. There were a lot of people, powerful people, in Jerusalem in the first century who wanted Jesus to be dead and to stay dead. Pilate agreed to the crucifixion to put down any kind of unrest. He wanted to keep the peace in the city. So if this guy's causing trouble, let's, let's eliminate him. The Jewish leaders basically strong-armed Pilate into, into agreeing to the crucifixion and, and okaying it. They wanted Jesus dead because he was a threat to their power and authority. How hard would it have been to th for them if, if this resurrection myth starts to perpetuate for them just to go get the corpse? Hey, look, they're full of it. Here he is. Nobody debated that he wasn't in there. They're all just trying to figure out where he was and what happened. C.S. Lewis writes about this idea that the Gospels have been doctored over time that they've been adjusted or, or tweaked to sort of support this mythology or this false notion of a resurrection. Here's what he writes about the gospel accounts. I've been reading poems, romances, vision, literature, legends, and mythologies all of my life. I know what they are like, and I know that none of them is like this, the New Testament accounts. Of this record, there are only two possible views. Either this is accurate reportage, pretty close to the facts themselves, or else, some unknown writer in second century, without known predecessors or successors, suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic, realistic fiction. If it's untrue, it must be narrative of this kind. The reader who doesn't see this has simply not learned how to read. Hear what he's saying? He's saying, like, we, you read a novel today that's fiction, and people put details in the story to make it believable. But that didn't exist in the ancient world. They didn't do that. So either somebody invented modern novels centuries earlier and nobody ever saw it coming or since, or this is the real thing. This brings us to what I would call the curious question. All four gospel accounts agree that the first people to witness the empty tomb and witness with their eyes in person the resurrected Jesus were women. Now to us, that's not strange. That's totally, that's good. But in the first century, this was a problem for the early Christians. 
it, it, actually was, it actually was a hindrance to the spread of the message. Roman historian Celsus writes that the part of the reason you shouldn't believe the Christian message of the resurrection is because the, the story depends on the eyewitness of, w- of women who, as we all know, are quite hysterical. I, I didn't say that. First century Roman historian Celsus said that. <laughs> this is a patriarchal society where women were not highly thought of. It's not a good thing. It's just what was going on at that time. So if you're going to doctor the Gospels, reinvent it a bit to support your, your, your story that he rose from the grave, this is the first thing you change. If you want other people to buy it, this is the first thing you write out and you change. But it isn't changed. Another thing I find quite curious about this story is the fact that nobody seemed to anticipate the resurrection. And you might be thinking, well, dead people stay dead. Why would they? But think about it for a minute. Here's why they would. Because Jesus repeatedly said he would rise. Repeatedly and specifically, he said, on the third day, I'm going to rise from the grave. Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, be handed over to sinful men, crucified, killed, and on the third day, raised to life. He says this in Luke 18, in Luke 9, in Matthew 20, in Mark 10, in Mark 14, over and over and over again. Jesus says, I'm going to be handed over, killed, and on the third day rise. On the third day, I'm going to rise from the grave. Hey, on the third day, after three days, I'm going to rise from the grave. On the third day, I'm not going to be dead. I'll rise from the grave. You'd think that like one of the disciples, the women would go, you know, it is day three. <laughs> Maybe we should just check. <laughs> Send somebody, you know, just, just to check, just to be sure. But the women who do go there are not looking for a live guy. They're looking for a corpse that they can anoint. Nobody sees it coming. Nobody sees it coming. Look at verse 5 again. This curious question. They were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? What a question. What are you looking for? Why do you seek the living among the dead? You're not going to find a living person in there. Now, for all the major religions of the world... If you want to encounter their leaders, their founders, how do you do that? Go to a museum or a shrine or some place that's revered where they were? Certainly. Or, and, and, and probably reading their writings, obeying their teachings, right? Somehow you, you, you engage with them through their thoughts and their ideas down through the ages. You can't actually encounter them because they're dead. But you can sort of connect with them by, by following their path. If you try to meet Jesus that way, you'll never truly meet him. Because he's not dead. You don't meet Jesus by just revering him and remembering him and trying to find out about him by reading things. Those are good things to do, but he's not a dead founder. He's a living Lord. It reminds me of a couple of years ago, my wife and I had the chance to go with Pastor Brian and, and Lorene to Israel. And we visited some amazing sites. And one of the sites that stands out most in my mind as being the both interesting, bo- most interesting and troubling is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That, that's just a fancy word for grave. <laughs> it's a massive uh, medieval structure church, like a maze-like church, built over what they believed to be the place where Jesus was buried. They built a church over everything in Israel. And they debate where the site was. But this is the most likely archaeological site for where he was buried. And inside this massive church... There's this shrine built over the place where the grave likely was. And Christian pilgrims from all over the world, every day of the week, every month of the year, year after year, line up to go in there. Now, part of me wanted to say, I admire that devotion. Another part of me wanted to scream, Luke 24, 5, he's not in there. Why do you look for the living among the dead? You're not going to find him in there. You bought a ticket, you wait in line for an hour to go in there. He's not there. That's not where you find him. This brings us to a shocking statement. Right after the question, why do you look for the living among the dead? These two men in dazzling clothes, which are angels, say to these women, we'll read verse 6, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. But the Son of Man, he said, must be handed over, crucified, on the third day rise. In other words, he's risen just like he said he would do. Friends, 
This is the central claim of Christianity. This is the whole ball game. This statement. He's not here, but has risen. Everything hangs on this. This is the Easter. It's not eggs and bunnies and brunch, as much as I love all of them. The whole thing, the whole thing about Christianity comes down to this statement. Is it true or not? Everything hangs on this. Um, Lee Strobel, who wrote the book, The Case for Christ, actually three books, that's the first of them, and the most famous, the movie was made from this book, and if you don't know the story, Lee Strobel was an atheist jur investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. His wife became a Christian, and he was annoyed, so he set out to prove it wrong, and in the course of using his investigative journalism to prove his wife wrong in her new faith, he came to faith in Christ himself. Fascinating read. I encourage you to pick that book up or watch that movie. He says in the introduction to this, his book, he said, even as an, as an atheist, I knew one thing about Christianity. Everything rises or falls in the resurrection. And he's exactly right. Even as an atheist, I knew the whole thing comes down to this. Is this true or not true? Christianity is not a philosophy. It's not a set of rules to follow. It's not even fundamentally a way of life. Christianity is fundamentally news. Not fake news, but good news. News, an announcement that God has done something in history and that something has changed everything. It's utterly different. The shocking announcement that he's conquered death. Everything hangs on this truth. Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through 17, and I don't think it can be more clear than this. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. <laughs> Simply put, if it's not true, then I'm a liar and you shouldn't listen. The whole thing's pointless. My nice Easter tie, some of you in your beautiful dresses, and some of you looking better than average, right, on, on Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, we're just playing a game here. You're just doing the religious thing, the traditional thing, if it isn't true. In fact, I would say, if it, Christ has not been raised, then you should pick a different religion. There's easier ones than Christianity. Make up your own. Seriously, just choose one. Decide, I'll take some of this from this one and this from this one, and I'll make it, I'll call it, you know, Jeffism and have my own religion. Because it, none of this matters if it isn't true. But if it is. But if it's true that God came in the flesh, lived a sinless life, died in your place, meaning you deserve death, to forgive you, and didn't stay dead but rose from the grave, that's got to change everything. Years ago, I met a man whose ex-wife was bringing their kids to our church. He was a hard-boiled atheist guy. And he, he was nervous about what his ex was getting his kids into. So he made an appointment to meet with me. He had like a legal pad out. We met for coffee. And he's like asking me all these questions, you know. I think he wanted to know, like, is this a cult? Are you sacrificing chickens? What are you doing with these kids, you know? <laughs> so we met. We talked through the list, you know. And I got to know him. I liked this guy. We met a couple of times, and I got to know him, ask him questions and hear about him. And he said, he found out that we do a lot of work in the community to serve the poor and help people. And he says, hey, I love what your church is doing for the community. I just don't think you need all the supernatural, miraculous stuff to do that. And we got to talk about the resurrection. He was asking about miracles, like, you know, he, his big hang-up was Jonah and the whale, or the fish. He said, you really believe that guy was the fish? And I said, well, listen, I'll put it this way. If God can raise a man from the dead, then he can store a guy in a fish for three days. <laughs> He's like, well, the resur about the resurrection. <laughs> he said, I think that's just a good story about good triumphing over evil. It's a metaphor. It's a nice symbol. But it's ridiculous to believe it actually happened. It, 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 the meaning of the resurrection, he said, is just good over evil. It's not real. And I said to him, and I'll say to you, if it didn't actually happen, it has no meaning for your life at all. It's a lie. When you read through the Gospels, I mentioned before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? The next book in the New Testament, if you're not familiar, is called Acts. It refers to the Acts of the Apostles, their actions. It's really the story of the birth of the church. Jesus dies, is resurrected, ascends to heaven, and then the Holy Spirit comes on his followers, which we're a part of now, and the church is born. 
throughout history. And every sermon recorded in Acts has one point. Sometimes my sermons have no point, but hopefully that's not today. <laughs> but this, every sermon in Acts has one point. You know what the point is? It's not a trick question. This is Easter. You can get this one. Say Jesus or resurrection and you're right. Right? Every single sermon you read in Acts, every sermon is about the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Christ. Why? Because they knew this is the whole ball game. We have nothing if this isn't true. It all hangs on this. And it's still true today. It all hangs on this. When you go to visit the grave of a loved one, family member, if you do, you're not encountering them, are you? You're encountering their memory. That can be meaningful and powerful. But you're not meeting them. How do you meet Jesus? How do you encounter him? This brings us to an incredible invitation. The cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection are are an invitation, really, to a relationship. Christianity is utterly unique in in the world in this way. Every other major world religion works on the principle of you gotta, you got to climb the ladder. If you're a, a Muslim, you follow the five pillars of the Quran and you hope that you escape the judgment of Allah. If you're a, a Buddhist, you follow the eightfold path of enlightenment and you hope that you, you can be, become the enlightened one like the Buddha. If you're a, a, a Hindu, you're following the law of karma, being reincarnated up and eventually reach nirvana. You're, or whatever religion, it's some form of doing enough, praying enough, giving enough, being spiritual enough, following the rules enough that eventually I make it. Escape God's judgment, become God myself, reach heaven, whatever you call it, right? It's some form of ladder climbing. Christianity fundamentally says, the world is broken and you're sinful. You can never climb high enough. The ladder won't reach. But I love you, God says. So I come to you. I come to you, he says. I live the life you can't live. I die in your place to pay for your brokenness and sin. And I don't stay dead. So it's not just your past is redeemed. I'm securing your future. I come out of the grave to give you a hope beyond this life and a power in your life right now. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That doesn't mean if you're a Christian, you just kind of muddle through and hang on till heaven. It means the resurrection power that raised Christ out of the grave comes into your life. If Jesus conquered sin and death, and the empty tomb is proof that he has, then there's no darkness or brokenness or shame in your life that he can't conquer. There's none. There's no hang-up you have about what was done to you in the past. There's no bitterness and anger over uh, uh, the brokenness of a relationship or loss you've experienced. There's no shame over things you did. All the stuff that you carry in here, and now we all look pretty good. You know, we, we put on a good show. We're all carrying our own baggage. The empty tomb says there's nothing that he can't conquer in your life. There's nothing he can't forgive and wipe clean. There's nothing he can't help you walk out of if you trust him. And you know how it begins? It doesn't mean you have to figure everything out on your own. You have to become an intellectual giant or a theologian. It begins like a seed, right? Just faith like a seed, the Bible says. Just enough to say, I want this. I want to know you, God. I want you. Just faith in his death on the cross as payment for your sin. Faith, just a little bit of faith that it really is true. It's not a fairy tale that he conquered the grave, that he is risen and reigning and wants to live in your heart and can secure your future. A friend of mine said, the gospel tells me that my past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. Who doesn't want that? I want a a past that's paid for and forgiven. I want a present that makes sense and has purpose, and I want to know I'm going somewhere. That's what the resurrection tells you, if you trust, if you're willing. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer as we close. Because some of you here, you're like me and you forget this. You just forget that it's true. That's why we say he is risen. You say he is risen indeed, just to remind ourselves that it's true. And some of you here don't know this. You're still wrestling with, am I good enough? Have I earned it? Can I measure up? Is it real? So I'm going to invite you to pray with me wherever you are. Let's bow. Father God, you know all things and you know our hearts completely. You know what we struggle with and what holds us back. 
For those that are here that, like me, we, we do believe, but we struggle sometimes. We get consumed with the petty events of our daily lives, and we just forget who you are. I pray that your spirit would remind us this morning that the resurrection is real. The tomb is really empty. You really are risen. And your power, your resurrection power, is available for whatever we're dealing with. For those of my brothers and sisters this morning who don't know you, they know about you, but they, don't, they never received this incredible message of grace and love and forgiveness. I pray that right now, in their own hearts, they, you would prompt them to pray a simple prayer of humbling themselves, acknowledging their need, acknowledging you as Lord, and inviting you to come into their life. You promise us that if we do that, you will. You will come in, and you will begin to change us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you, our Savior, our risen King, our Redeemer and friend. Amen.